We have tried in this, uh, in this gathering to be uh, genuinely eclectic, and I think that, you know, for instance, yesterday, having the guy who invented rotisserie baseball uh, was an example of that. Uh, we are closing with a, uh, with a theme that is something that is very much a part of what we are and is in our title, but we really have not addressed directly today, and that is politics. And the person who is leading that is a um, guy who spent a number of years in Nashville as a country songwriter. As I say, we, we try to cover all the bases. Mark McKinnon is about as smart as it gets when it comes to understanding politics today. Uh, he has worked for uh, an, an eclectic array of, of uh, clients that range from Ann Richardson, <coughs> the Democratic governor of Texas, to George W. Bush, the Republican governor of Texas. He is someone whose column on the Daily Beast and commentary on the Daily Beast is always smart. He tried to get uh, Governor Christie to run for president and to his, I think Governor Christie now seems to be running for vice president instead, perhaps. Uh, he also, Mark, uh, last week anointed Herman Cain, the winner of the most recent Democratic or Republican uh, presidential debate, um, and said that Newt Gingrich was the smartest person in the room. The point is that Mark has opinions, they are informed opinions, they are reasoned, and uh, they are always interesting. And uh, it is my great pleasure to have him at the Shorenstein Center this uh, semester, returning with us for another round after teaching here in the past. And uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here and excited to be able to hold the gavel here for the final session. And uh, it, the Shorenstein Center, as you all know, is constantly focused and thinking about where journalism's been, where journalism is, where it's heading, and where it intersects with policy and politics. And uh, it's been a fascinating discussion over the last several days to think about the extent to which all of this has been happening in the middle of economic chaos and, and, and a revolution in technology. So the subjects are fascinating, they're important, uh, they're, uh, they have consequences. So it's a fascinating dialogue that's going on here and a really important one. I, I'm really happy that we can close the session on an upbeat note uh, because so much of uh, the discussions that we have with our colleagues and friends in journalism I mean, I can take it back to I mean, how technology has disrupted the music business and just crushed right. uh, uh, the economics of that business. But, but there's also a lot of thought about how it's the impact that it's had on journalism, technology has had on journalism. A lot of it positive, but a lot of it uh, consequential in terms of, uh, of what it's done to the, the old model and what it's done to a lot of uh, journalists who are no longer working. So uh, we have as our guest somebody who has. Uh, 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 who got in the middle of the revolution, grabbed a pitchfork, jumped the fence from the Washington Post, where he was very successful, uh, with a partner of his when he was just 35 years old, and has created one of the great success stories uh, in journalism today, and has really created an entirely new model that people look at with uh, uh, great, uh, often jealousy, uh, but great admiration because you, they have really bent the model and created uh, a success story. This is Jim Vandehei, who's joining me today, who was the co-founder of Politico. Uh, Jim, you, you said uh, at one point, our ambition is to emerge from the great upheaval in journalism and become the dominant publication covering Washington <coughs> politics and governance. I don't know when you said that, but it is, that's what's happened. And uh, you have a lot of... Uh, admirers in the business and you have some critics, but I don't think that there's any question that, that you have become, you've transformed uh, journalism uh, in, in this country today. So let me just throw it out there and, and give us the story about how you jumped from a very successful platform, you're a very successful well-known journalist. What made you and John Harris decide to jump the fence and take on what at that time must have seemed like a very ambitious, bold idea, and you really had no idea whether or not it would be successful. Right. Well, first off, thanks uh, for having me here. It is a great honor. It's a great group. Uh, in, in Mark's honor, I now drive an F-150 and only listen to country music, and that's not a joke. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a 72 <laughs> F-150. <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, that's a, so why did we do this? Um, in, in retrospect, we didn't know. So in 2006, I was working for Marilee Schwartz. We're at the Washington Post. And I think of journalism and a lot of the questions that were asked in that last segment, I hope we can get to because I I'm often feel like a lonely one, but I am a total optimist about what's happening to the media. And, and the reason that is is because we're just a, we're in the middle of the great upheaval. We don't know what's going to happen. We're finally, I think, as an industry making a lot of progress. But back in 2006, nobody was making progress. And I don't think even in early 2006, people saw the destruction that was coming. And people now think we were prophets and in, in that we saw this coming. We didn't. We were just lucky uh, in our timing of, of when we decided to do this. We were at the Post. We loved our jobs. John Harris is running the political coverage. I'm writing about politics. Love the Post. Love the Graham family. Love the people I worked with. Never really even thought about leaving until we started having a couple of conversations. And it was John Harris, myself, Mike Allen, uh, who, who joined us uh, from the get-go, uh, and Chris Eliza, who did not, who's still at the Washington Post. And we were just talking about how much the web was changing our, our jobs. And at the time, literally, the web at the Post was in a different area. It was in Virginia, and the Washington Post was in D.C., so they were separate institutions. But you could start to see how things were changing, that the stories that were really having echo online were different than the ones that we happened to be putting on A1 in the paper. Yet all anybody cared about what was in the paper, despite the fact that we had empirical data that way more people were reading us online. And so we started talking about how one of the neat things about the web is the stories that were really having echo were the ones we were most proud of, regardless of where they were. They were because we had a scoop or we had a really uh, interesting analysis or, or conceptual way to look at what was happening uh, in politics. And I remember one day having lunch and we just said, you know, what if we just created a company where all we did was do really interesting stories, broke news and did stuff that people would actually want to read, uh, which seems like a novel insight. Um, <laughs> And it, it, at that time, it was just sort of a what if. Uh, and that was right around, I, I think, when Google was, was buying or bought YouTube. And we had a discussion about, you know what? Th that idea about just getting people who can do interesting things uh, and do it all the time, boy, that wouldn't be that expensive if someone came along from Google and wanted to do it. What, what would it actually cost? And what we came up with is it wouldn't cost that much, because even the best named journalists, from a business standpoint, were grossly underpaid. Uh, if you're just looking at it as a raw business equation, household name, famous journalists who were not making that much money. And we thought, boy, for a premium, I bet you you could get everybody into one place. And if you got them all into one place and you took advantage of cable and took advantage of the web, you could probably have impact pretty quick. Uh, and that led us to go talk to smart people, do what we do as journalists, talk to people who'd been in, in business and, hey, would this work? Every person we talked to said, hey, not only would that work, I'd like to back it or I'd like to be part of it. So we knew we were on to something. We ended up hooking up with a guy who has something that I'll never have, which is just a ton of money, uh, who, <laughs> who said and had a shared vision and said, good, I'll do it. I'll back it. I'll call your bluff. Uh, and, and we did it. We left uh, between that conversation I talked about, where we, that what if conversation to the day we left the post, it was about five months. That's how quickly uh, this unfolded. And within eight months, so just three months after that, we launched and went, uh, went public. The website went live in uh, January of 2007, and newspaper. So are, 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 you're, you're successful. Does that mean you're making money? And if so, how? We are. Thankfully, we are making money. And I, I, I kind of want to walk you through our business model so people understand the distinction between what we do and what the New York Times does or the, or the struggles, I think, that USA Today or regional papers face. We are, and we've always believed, that the future for content is extremely bright for niche sites, for sites that can dominate an individual area where there are a lot of people who are, who are really interested in that. So sports, finance, in our case, politics. So what we do is we try to get everybody who matters in government, in Congress, the White House, sort of what we consider influentials reading us. So that is our core audience. When you get that, there's a bunch of advertisers who want to advertise against that content. And they're called issue advocacy advertisers. So if Coca-Cola advertises with us, they're not advertising to sell you a can of Coke. What they're trying to do is influence how people perceive their brand, or they might try to influence legislation that's taking place on Capitol Hill. And so we've had a ton of success in basically getting, commanding the attention of, of people that matter in Washington, in the political process, in the media, et cetera. And then advertisers have flocked to that. So we were able to pretty quickly become number one 
in that issue advocacy space, which has been able to fund the bulk of our journalism. So we've been profitable just on issue advocacy advertising alone, and that's till you know six months ago was basically 100% of our revenue. We've recently launched uh, subscription-based products, but not like the New York Times where you can you know sign up for the weekend or pay your $70 a year and get access to the site. We have really high-end premium verticals that basically take the political philosophy of the use of overwhelming force, hire really good journalists and put them in an individual place. And we cover sectors now, so technology, healthcare, and energy are the going? first three. And that's been really successful. Again, because there's a, a big group of people, particularly mostly in Washington, who are very interested and actually need that information to do their job. <clears throat> so we have two revenue streams that now help us fund the public journalism that most people who come to the site see. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The owner of Atlantic Magazine uh, said, and I'm not sure when he said this, but you probably know, it was much happier to do what we were doing until Politico <coughs> arrived in the world and bemoaned your velocity and metabolism. Uh, it must have been a while ago because <coughs> more recently they are now trying to copy what right. you're doing and are really, from all I can see, trying to, do, to replicate your model. Right. Uh, as are a lot of other people. Now, uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg's operation, it, I mean, it's sort of similar ideas of get the best people, pay them a lot of money. And that's got to be flattering because it's competition, but it also, you got to see it coming <laughs> over your shoulder too, right? right. Yeah. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to David Bradley's frustrations with velocity or, or, or the DNA of our organization. What I can speak to is the competition. I mean, now it sometimes feels like we've been around for 20 years. Yeah, I was surprised uh, <clears> when I realized it was just four years ago that you started, because it seems like right. how, how you've reshaped the environment has been a lot longer. We have so many people doing now what we did four years ago. So you have to be in this constant state of reinvention, which gets really back to that technology discussion they're having here uh, for the past hour. You have to constantly be figuring out what do readers need, or how are their consumption habits changing, and making sure that you're evolving with them. You know, one of the things that, that we've talked about or in one of the emails we exchanged was that idea of, you know, did Politico contribute to the demise of newspapers? Well, n no, newspapers uh, contributed to the demise of newspapers uh, by doing a couple things. One, being really slow, uh, shockingly slow, to adapt to very clear evidence that your readers wanted something that you weren't offering on a different platform that you weren't paying attention to, and then collectively entering into one of the maybe dumbest business decisions in, in the history of any industry, take all this content, which is extremely expensive to create, and let's just give it away for free, which is what every company decided to do online. It would be like Coca-Cola saying, yes, if you go to the grocery store, you have to pay for the Coke, but if you go to a vending machine, it's free. <laughs> and it, it, the economics don't work. So, you know, we, we didn't have any, we, our model is different. We didn't have much to do with that. And now what happens is, when you have success in anything, in media, uh, you see it all the time in political campaigns. People just do whatever the last person did that was successful. So you now see everyone trying to have more metabolism, higher DNA, more interaction with readers, doing a lot of things that we did. I don't, it isn't a strategy that I would recommend for somebody else because like in the case of, of National Journal, well, if people want that, they already got that from us. And so the, the, the ability to leapfrog above that is really difficult because we've already been able to, to, to sort of get our readers to know what to expect from us. Authority, speed, often overwhelming coverage of, of an individual issue that we think that they care about. Let me, let me tell you what you guys uh, said as sort of your mission back when you started. And what I want to ask you is how much of this have, have, has, has, have you upheld? And I'm, I'm kind of interested to know what didn't work. Right. A and then we'll, maybe we'll talk about what's next. But you said when you launched, mm -hmm. we want to be a web-centered rather than print-centered, focused subject matter, small star quality staff, staff outreach, and multi-platform. And right. is that what, what you are today? And Everything but the small staff. <laughs> um, we're now 220 people or something like that with, with the business side, which is good and bad. It's really hard to keep, a, uh, keep alive like a high metabolism, let's uh, continue to evolve, let's teach everybody what it means to work at Politico versus working at the New York Times or the Washington Post. It's harder the bigger you get. It's great because you have the success, you have more reporters, you have more infrastructure, you have more business assistance, but the trick for us, and I don't, I mean, you could sit back and say, well, great, you guys are a success, so you know, congratulations, you make money and people pay attention to your journalism. If we ever think that, and I honestly believe this, and it's one of the reasons I'm fairly compulsive about what we do at Politico is that if we're not constantly evolving, if we're not constantly watching for 
changes in how people are consuming information and making sure that we're protecting the quality of our brand, the quality of our journalism, somebody's going to come around and eat our lunch. I, I truly believe that. It might not happen overnight. Maybe we now have enough durability that you can sustain mediocrity for a short period of time. You cannot sustain it for a long period of time because readers are fickle, they're demanding, and you have to be able to provide the product that you know that they want. You have to provide it the way that they're consuming it. So what do you tell, you mentioned conversations that you have about sort of your culture when you're talking to your reporters and right. staff about how you're different from the New York Times or other organizations. What are those conversations like? What, do you, what, what are your sort of dictates to your reporters and people working for you to maintain the culture that you've got? Right, I mean, there's a couple things. One, it starts in the type of people that you choose to, to sort of bring aboard. Like we really try to find reporters uh, who can sort of, who are difference makers, who, can, who, we, who we see have broken news, who are smart, who are hungry, who are thorough, who are trusted, and we do what it takes to try to get them on our staff and, and keep them there. That's the most important ingredient. Once you get them there, it's what makes us different. You know, we definitely obsess about speed. Not reckless speed, but speed. Being first to something pays real dividends in, in, the, in this media culture, whether people like it or, or not. Uh, I happen to think it's a fine thing, and I think that uh, it's something we try to protect. But then it's also pushing people to be interesting. Most journalists, in my experience, <clears throat> left on their own devices kind of well, everyone else is covering it this way. Or, well, we've got to do this story because I think, well, the Times will do this story. No, 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 no. Do a story because you're telling people something that they need to know, didn't know, or help them think anew about facts that they might already know. And that might seem like a small distinction, but it's a pretty big distinction in the way we try to approach uh, journalism. And when, it's, when it works, it works really well. And our, and our website will pop with very interesting stories you can't find elsewhere. So uh, speed and velocity is a premium, and, and obviously you have a great track record of getting the best quality people possible, but occasionally bad things happen to you too, mm -hmm. like happened in the last, this week with, right. a, with a reporter, mm -hmm. and, and you addressed mm -hmm. it immediately, uh, and maybe you want to characterize that for us, but, uh, but, but, it's, but my question <coughs> is, does, does speed and velocity create the kind of problems where you have reporters making, cr creating shortcuts? I don't think so. You know, it's one of the things you're studying, just so everybody knows in the audience, we had a, a young reporter covering uh, transportation policy, great woman, great journalist, who cut corners. You know, in, in our industry, you cannot, you can't plagiarize. You can't take information you found elsewhere and put it into your stories. We found out that she had, and we did what you have to do. It was, I'm happy to say I've had only one bad day at Politico, and it was that day, having to do that, knowing the effect it has on someone's career, to be blunt, sucks. Yeah. Um, I don't think, you know, I've talked to a lot of young reporters about it since. I don't think it's because, oh my gosh, there's this pressure, because it's happened before. It's happened at other institutions. It's happened at the Times, the Post, the Wall Street Journal. It happens, and you don't ever fully understand why it happens. And I don't even think the person doing it always fully understands uh, why they did it. Uh, but, you know, it's, you, you want to make sure that journalists know the values that we have, which is you can't, there's just certain things you can't do. Reporters coming out of school are very well educated. They know what you can and cannot do. It is certainly incumbent upon us to teach them, to reinforce it. You know, one of the sad things about reporters coming up now is that they don't get to work at the smaller newspapers. They don't get to have to just cover a, you know, a grinded out beat where you really learn those values. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the things we're looking at is even more and more teaching for, for young journalists who haven't had that experience to make sure that you're constantly reinforcing, even if they know it in an academic sense, that they know it in a real sense. That's a great point, and that gets back to some of the conversation we had in, in the last session. I, I think on your site, as part of maybe your mission statement, you talk about amalgamating old media values of fairness and accuracy with the speed and immediacy of new technologies. Right. So it sounds like that's something you actually focus on, and you made the point that they, well, so uh, what do you look for in new reporters uh, today, and, uh, and I guess, you, you say you instill some of those values, but maybe some additional training, knowing right. that they're not coming up through the old farm system. Uh, so let me combine that with what are you looking for now in new reporters, and can you talk a little bit about where you see things heading around the corner? Well, in most reporters that we hire are experienced reporters, mainly because our core audience, again, l last month we had 9 million people came to our site, according to our internal, so probably by the, you know, the com scores of the world, they'd probably say four and a half, five million 5 million people came to the site. That's a huge audience, but our, our core audience are really sophisticated readers, much more sophisticated than your average reader as far as their n level of knowledge about policy and politics. So most reporters we hire are pretty experienced. We don't hire 
Uh, we don't hire many people right out of college and then put them on a beat. That is a, that is a rarity uh, in, our, in our newsroom. But what you're looking for when you see these reporters are you want to see people that can write. You want to see people that are smart, that hustle, that are ambitious. Uh, ideally, you want to see people that have a track record for having some success. Uh, you know, those are, and I don't think that that's that any different today than it was 10 years ago. Do they ago. write as well today as they did mm -hmm. 10 or 20 years ago? Or I mean, Mary Lee uh, can, can speak to this better because she was an editor. My experience is like, a lot of us weren't that good writers uh, <laughs> 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> at least me. Uh, uh, so I don't, I, do they write worse? I don't know that they write worse. And one of the, I guess one of the big problems I have with journalists that are younger coming out of school, I don't think this is just journalism, is that Technology is doing something to us. It's doing something to our brains. I see a lot of smart kids who come out of this institution, other institutions, who are probably on paper and in tests brilliant. They are incapable of coherence sometimes. They're incapable <laughs> of sifting through all of this information that's racing through their head and just telling me what the hell did you find out or what does that mean? And it's, and I don't know how you fix that because I think if you're sitting there and you're, you're constantly on Twitter, you're constantly on Facebook, and you're constantly getting these flashes of information, there's enough books now written about this, it is doing something right, to yeah. the brain. And I, I don't know how we undo that because uh, technology is, is everywhere, but you know, getting people to write, it's one of the biggest shocks. I never edited uh, when, before we started this, and I don't really edit now. I, I help with a lot of the conceptualization, but I don't do a lot of line editing. I'm always horrified, to be honest, sometimes at, like, at, at the writing I'll see from even some of the people who are the best reporters that I've ever seen. They need really he real help. I never fully appreciated how great editors are, how essential editors are, and how when you can find a fantastic editor, they are pure gold because they can take all this great information and they can make it sing, and they can do that in a very accessible way for readers. So maybe there's a greater premium going uh, forward on having somebody like or some <laughs> bodies like that in the organization because you're right, I heard, I heard other journalists uh, in the last few days talking about going forward, the, the reporters are having to multitask platforms, right. just as you said, they're, they're, they're tweeting, they're, they're you know, got TV going, and, and the, so the greater need going forward or made greater relevance will be for those organizations that have people have like that. The, 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 well, no, right. obviously, right. I mean, but, if you looked at our newsroom, you'd be like, oh my God, do people talk about you as a new media innovative company? You've got a bunch of old media guys and women sitting around who worked at the Post, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. We have tons of them. We have to. We have all of our editors are extremely experienced, so you can guard against things that happened to us this week, so you can make sure that you're writing with authority and that you're writing with, with clarity. You have to have both. That's why I don't think, I don't have a doom and gloom view that technology and suddenly people are just going to be crowdsourcing and we're only going to get our information off of Twitter. No way. There's still a huge market out there for really good reporting and reporting that you can trust. We see it every day. The New York Times sees it every day. The Wall Street Journal. Th these institutions are going to be around. It's just a difficult period that technology changed the industry rapidly. Now our industry is adapting pretty well. Look at the progress that most media institutions have made. Have they downsized? Yes. I might argue in some cases they right-sized. I don't know that, that numbers necessarily equals better quality. And certainly at some level it does, but companies have become more efficient, which isn't a bad thing. I, I would argue that because papers had so much success uh, in the 70s and 80s and they became profit machines, that as a business, and, and now in our, in our new roles we spend a lot of time thinking about the business and the culture of a business, they started to operate for, like non, not for profits. They started to take things for granted. They started to get complacent as an organization. And when that happens, I don't think as a business great things happen. And I don't think when, uh, for journalism great things happen. I think, I think people will match up technology with great values that reporters still have and will always have. And there'll be a market for that journalism. You talk, let's talk about <laughs> politics a little bit. You, you talked about in the last presidential campaign that the political and modest but important ways helped to uh, uh, define the, the, the last election. I think I'm getting that right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and how will, how will you try and define this election? Or how are to be honest, this election is going to be a lot harder for us than, than last one. Because last one, we were new. We were the only media company now in retrospect that was really focused on let's be fast, let's be comprehensive, let's own everything, let's own every minute, every hour. And it really worked. I think there weren't many major themes, conceptual stories, small scoops, big scoops that we weren't too first. I think, I think we, as an organization, did better, in, in my opinion, 
than, than most at doing that. And, and some of them were trivial, like John McCain not knowing if he had seven, eight, or nine houses. Uh, Sarah Palin's wardrobe, that was Gene Cummings, our reporter, going through the, the filings, a good old-fashioned way to figure out, like, what, whoa, what is this, what is she spending all this money on clothes for? Which became a very a defining moment for her. We wrote a lot about, uh, in the early days of the upheaval, the tension between Palin uh, and McCain, which defined the end days of, of obviously, of, of his campaign. And so I thought we had a lot of success. People paid attention to us. One of the amazing thing is, I was thinking about this the other day, we co-hosted a presidential debate in May of 2007. We were three months old. I mean, that's how quick our growth was that we were able to establish ourselves, get a debate, be in the mix, and be taken seriously that quick. I never would have imagined that it would, I thought it would take years to be able to establish our credibility, get people to pay attention to us. It just happened much quicker than we thought. And I think one of the big reasons was because we just left right when the industry cratered and not because we saw that it was going to crater. It just happened. So people paid a lot more attention to us because for journalists, we were a success story. We were hiring and for the you know, media consumers, they're like, ah, oh, what's this new thing? And it, it, those things really worked. And again, that was luck. That wasn't us knowing that that was the right moment. I shouldn't say that, but. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you see things for this, this cycle? What's going to happen and how are you, how are I you think, guys going to I think it's way harder for us. I think we, our staff is exponentially more talented this time around, more experienced, we just have more people. But everybody does what we do now. I mean, this campaign is a lot different than last campaign. There's not a news organization that's not throwing massive resources at it, that's not obsessed on the metabolism and the DNA that's not, you know, even some of the tricks we do to try to simplify stories so audiences can understand them. Five things to watch is one of the things we used to do before the debate. I noticed before the last debate on the Washington Post and New York Times, voila, five things to watch in the debate. So every trick you get, every new thing you do, people, people do too. So I think, and this is probably uh, a little contrary to what other folks might think, maybe even in my shop, um, that there is going to be a, a, an increasingly big premium on deeper dive journalism. I think the key to, to, to busting through now, speed won't let you break through, won't really let you sort of drive a conversation. Mm -hmm. You have to, I think, come to the table with real goods, real reporting that other people don't have, which to me is great because I think it could, be, uh, it could be a little, at least mini resurgence of longer form journalism. We're back testing to, this in a couple future, of years. Huh? Back to the future. I do think that the story, if you think even recent stories that are starting to break through tend to be these more heavily reported, you can't do it in two days type of pieces. So hopefully we can experiment with that in this cycle. We have a big enough staff so we can do more of it. We're doing, uh, we partnered with Random House. We're sort of their first lab rat on doing uh, uh, sort of a niche ebook selling political books on, on Politico. And we're partnering with, uh, with them and with John Meacham and Evan Thomas to write a series of, of ebooks about the campaign. You know, maybe I think we're going to do three or four in the course of the campaign. So those will be not book size, but bigger than a magazine article, you know, 20,000 words or so richly reported pieces. So we'll see. I don't know. We may sell tons of them. Maybe I'll find out there isn't a huge market. But that's, you, you're going back to that last segment, you have to constantly be experimenting and you have to be, encourage people to fail. That's one of the things we try to do in our culture. Like, take a risk on, on trying a new form or a new idea. And if you fail, so what? You learn from it, dust yourself off and, and go do it. You, if you, when you start to get complacent and don't want to take those risks, that's when I think you, you sort of, you can start to atrophy. So I want to take the chair's prerogative to ask a question that I really want to know. It may not interest a lot of other people, but uh, so I, I assume that most of you are familiar with Politico, and if you're not, you, you should be. Uh, and, and if you are familiar with Politico, you probably know about Mike Allen, and if you're not, you should be. And you probably read the playbook, and if you don't, you should. The playbook comes out every morning, and it is an unbelievable uh, compilation of the zeitgeist of, of Washington and politics. Mike Allen is just... When he, when he talks about hiring talent, Mike Allen is one of the most talented people I've ever run into uh, in journalism. Uh, and he's a fascinating character. Uh, and and he, somehow, I, I, first of all, I think he's, I think there must be three of them, because it's impossible that one person could produce what he does, but he must have some, some sort of algorithm computer thing that, that he did. I, I want to know what the secret is to this guy, because <coughs> cause he's, I know he's got a network of about a million people, and yet I'll get emails in the middle of the night that say, you know, something about Lance Armstrong or something that I, right. you know, I'm on the board. And 
I know he's not, <laughs> he can't be up at three, but he is somehow, and, he's, and I know he's not doing that with just me, but hundreds of, <laughs> thousands of other people, so I, what makes this guy tick? We tell every, you're asking what we tell new reporters, we tell every new reporter our expectation is not that you're going to be Mike Allen or work <laughs> Mike Allen's hours. <laughs> I mean, you know Mike. I mean, one of the greatest things is it's not only is he a great journalist, he's one of the, the best people. One, I know. one of my best good. friends, so I'm extremely uh, yeah. biased on the Mikey. But his playbook is easily, uh, I would say it's the most influential email that gets distributed perhaps in the world every morning. I mean, I know the readers, and it's, it is, it's, I know the readers and the feeders. And it is, uh, someday I hope he writes a book about it because it is the most amazing collection of influential people Well, I mean, did you mention the, the feeders. I mean, he must have so many people feeding him stuff all the time. Trying He's to... a well-sourced fella. Uh, it's, it's really amazing. <laughs> uh, that's for sure. Uh, but how he does it, I mean, people always ask that. The New York Times had a whole cover piece sort yeah, of trying, to get behind, story, yeah. trying to get behind the, the mystery of Mike. And the truth is, like, he just has a, he has a special gift for getting people to talk. He's an extremely gracious and sincerely gracious person in a city that's often not gracious, so it's, it's sort of easy to lampoon or think, ah, there's no way that someone's actually that nice. He actually is. Yeah. Uh, and it's paid d uh, dividends for him as a journalist and that people trust him. And they, they, they trust that they'll get a fair shake. And, you know, it's not that he just writes nice things. He often can, can skewer people. And when it, when it happens from Mike, you know, it's people, it's just trusted because people know that uh, he has a fantastic source network. But, you know, we were talking earlier about changing consumption habits and being sort of understanding your audience and being willing to change. One of the things that we've done that people haven't paid attention to that is one of the most successful things and goes to uh, really understanding your audience is that our audience is a BlackBerry audience. It's not an iPhone audience. Our core audience, they, I bet you, is 95% BlackBerry users. And so we did spin-offs of Mike Allen's playbook for everything from energy to defense to the lobbying industry to Congress that might not have Mike's readership, but have huge readership and huge influence that go out every morning around 6 a.m. that are a, a combination of original reporting and aggregation and zeitgeist uh, setting in reading. And they're just, they're just simple. They're email format, but they're formatted to look beautiful and work beautifully just on email on the BlackBerry. And again, that's, that wouldn't really work for most industries because most people, wow, my, most of our users are either using an Android-based phone or they're using an iPhone. But it's knowing your industry and then whatever. I don't, even if you don't want to produce it that way, produce it that way so people can get the content and don't get all worked up about are they reading it on paper, are they reading it on their tablet, are they reading it uh, on email. Just figure out the way they are reading it and feed it. What have been the biggest news stories for Politico over the years? I mean, you had asked uh, this year. I went back to check. Okay. Uh, now, and I thought for sure, my gosh, it'll be like these uh, really sensational stories. How dumb is it? It turns out it was great. <laughs> uh, that wasn't the biggest, but that was a good one. Um, uh, the, uh, the biggest story easily uh, for us was a piece that Mike Allen wrote uh, after uh, the, uh, the assassination of bin Laden. And he had fabulous sources in the CIA uh, and in the White House and was first with tons of vivid details. And that was off the charts, easily the biggest traffic story for the last couple of years for us. The next two, and this was really interesting and maybe gratifying for, for all of us that like, still care about uh, substance and policy. The next two were about the debt limit fight. Really? And this was really interesting. And I've talked to other people who saw the same thing. On our site, I have never seen a policy issue have such, tra such high traffic. Didn't see it during healthcare. Everyone's like, oh, there wasn't great healthcare coverage. Healthcare was the most thoroughly covered uh, domestic issue in the history of our republic. You all just didn't read it. Uh, and and that, is, that is a fact. Oh, there was tons of great reporting on healthcare. People just weren't reading it. But on the debt limit, traffic was through the roof. And not just on sort of the politics of it. We would have a piece on like the Gang of Six proposal, the alternative proposal for, for dealing with uh, long-term debt. And, uh, and the Google traffic to that would be extremely high. So it wasn't just our insiders from the Hill being interested in it. People were really fixated on that debate. And I think the reason was is because it was a, a moment where people really paid attention to Washington and really thought it was an epic battle that could have a profound effect on their life. So people were captivated by it from beginning until end. And so there, you know, at least sometimes it was gratifying that there are people who really do want stories of, of coverage of, of pretty deep substance. We did, I went back and checked, because uh, someone had asked, did, uh, we did 500, uh, more than 500 stories on, on the debt limit. Just to, you, yes, we obsess about a story uh, uh, when, when they're big. And a lot of those were by David Rogers and other folks on the Hill, and a lot of them were wonky, and all of them were better traffic than, than most stories. So that was good. You know, uh, interesting about that, uh, the 
as a consequence of that debate, uh, the, the debt ceiling debate, uh, economic confidence in the consumer index dropped 20 points. It was interesting <coughs> that, that uh, Bill McInturff did some great research on this and, and discovered that it wasn't the outcome that caused the collapse, yep. it was the nature of the debate itself. Yep. And just to give you an idea how bad consumer confidence is right now, is in large part as a result of that debate, the average consumer confidence index number when a president runs for re-election and wins is 95. When they run for re-election and lose, the number is 76. The number today is 55. So Obama has to improve that number by 20 points just to lose. <coughs> That's how bad it is. Uh. I want to invite uh, folks up for questions now, and, and uh, let me just kick it off with, uh, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and get right to questions. Go ahead. I'm going to try to move this thing. Uh, Jim Snyder, former Shorenstein Center fellow, now a, a fellow at the Safra Center. Uh, I haven't heard you mention Albatron Communications, which is the parent company of Politico. They have seven TV it's Albert. stations. Albert. Albert, yeah. yeah. Uh, seven TV stations, including the flagship <laughs> in Washington, D.C., the right. ABC affiliate. Um, now, question could go, your answer a variety of different ways. You know, early on, I would imagine that opened some doors from getting you started to have one of the major TV outlets in the nation's capital. Right. Um, but my question really focuses on something different. It relates to the values that you're inculcating in your journalists when you deal with a certain type of conflict of interest in reporting. So right. you've run three stories on spectrum policy, including a front page story, a profile of Gordon Smith, the head of the NAB. Mm -hmm. And uh, I considered that a little bit of a puff piece, actually. There was no mention uh, that your company uh, had a huge stake in the issues that were covered, literally hundreds of billions of dollars. Jerry Fritz, your VP of Government Affairs, is a very aggressive lobbyist on the Hill and at the FCC and whatnot um, on these issues. No mention. You had two other articles on ince incentive auctions, major piece of legislation, also part of the American Jobs Act, a, a large part. Again, um, you know, some problems with the sourcing, not very diverse, but the big problem was there was no mention uh, that Politico has a dog, you know, in that issue. So uh, the Washington Post recently had an editorial on this subject, and they did acknowledge that they have six TV stations and a significant interest in the issue, but I did not see that at Politico. So it comes into the values, the journalistic values that you're trying to calculate. I, I know most people wouldn't know that, but I, I, I consider that a significant omission. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Uh, I mean, I, yes, our owners, uh, our TV's, uh, our company's owned by uh, All Britain. I wish that I read every single story uh, that's on the site. We probably produce about you know 200 per day. Mm -hmm. I would say I don't know about that specific case. I'm not familiar with those stories. I would say. We should, if that is the case, undoubtedly always disclose that. We certainly did. It came up as a big issue uh, during the uh, Comcast uh, purchase uh, of NBC because obviously we had, uh, our, I think our, one of the TV stations had a dog uh, in that fight and I know we were vigilant about making sure in every single one of those cases that we're making it clear that the parent company of ours, even though there's really not a ton of interaction uh, with, between the TV stations and Politico, that they do have an interest. So. I think you make a fair point. I'm not, I wish I were familiar with those exact stories and I could argue the details with you, but I do think if, in fact, what you're saying is true, I would agree then that there should be a disclosure in those stories. It's a small point. We're talking about literally hundreds of millions of dollars. Arguably, the, the prime asset of your parent company are the right. licenses it has. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree it's a fair point. point. I would have to look at the specific story. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a sophomore at the college. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about flashes of information, and I mean, I'm behind my smartphone all the time, mm -hmm. in class, whatever. Um, tweeting about like what the guy's saying or what the professor's talking about. Um, do you think this interconnectedness online and you know everyone's online all the time creating a dialogue as they say, do you think that's good for us and for having dialogue face to face in the real world like you know confronting each other? Right. I mean this is uh, we're a new media company. I don't Twitter and I don't have a Facebook account. I'm, kind of, I'm actually kind of an old media guy. I prefer to read a, a newspaper. So certainly at a personal level, I'd rather talk to somebody. Uh, at a personal level, I'd often rather pick up a newspaper despite the fact that we ask most of our people to read us uh, online. I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I just don't get all spooled up about like, is this great or is this not great that people are on Twitter all the time or that people are sharing secrets I wouldn't share with people on Facebook, but whatever. God bless them. If they want to do it, uh, let them do it. I'm all for freedom. I'm all for people utilizing technology uh, to communicate. My job isn't to, to have sort of an opinion about whether that's righteous or not righteous, good or bad for society. It's to make sure that at least even if I'm not on 
those devices, if I'm not utilizing these technologies, then I'm making sure as a company that we're as quick as we can possibly be to make sure that we're getting our journalism onto those platforms in a way that those readers on those platforms want them. Like that, to me, that's my duty uh, to our readers. Uh, so, you know, there's no doubt that it's, it's changing. I mean, one of the things with Twitter that I wrestle with is, and, I, and again, I don't mean to sound like a, I often feel like I'm an old fogey lecturing my young uh, reporters, but I don't like the idea that people are spending all day Twittering, you know, tweeting when they could be reporting. And I, I wonder sometimes like how much of that is productive for what they're trying to do versus they're just wasting their time uh, uh, sending around information. I think some of it's good. You can promote your work. You can, you can create this relationship with, with the reader. You know, some of it probably can be a distraction. And for us, one of the things we've really had to struggle with is, listen, when you're, I don't care if you're on Twitter, Facebook, if you're representing us at a public forum, you're representing Politico, and you can't be expressing your opinions. You shouldn't be saying things that might reflect poorly upon the company. And that, that is one of the bigger challenges, because one, you can't keep up with it. Nobody's sitting there. I don't have an assistant who reads every tweet, so I can go like, back that off. Uh, but whatever. I mean, I, I think this is a great time uh, for, for technology and for media and trying to figure out these questions. And there's tons of really smart people, whether they're at MIT, whether at the New York Times, whether they're at Politico, whether they're wherever they are, that are figuring this stuff out. And to me, that's what's thrilling. That's why people should not be uh, so depressed about it. Can journalism survive? I, I, I believe journalism will survive. I think, I tell young journalists all the time, I think it's a better time to be a young journalist than when I got in uh, 15 or 20 years ago. I think there's tons of opportunity. I think it might be the Wild West. You're not coming in with the baggage that a lot of reporters, uh, older reporters might have where they don't really want to deal with technology, don't really care uh, about uh, Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and so they have some real inherited advantages and there's tons of opportunity and there's a ton of opportunity for them to experiment and see if journalism is right and what journalism looks like today, whether that fits for what they want to do with their career. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bernard Marguerite. I used to be a French correspondent in Eastern Europe for Le Monde and other TV, etc. I uh, Fulbright Fellow, four times research fellow at this university and last time at the Sorenstein. I'm uh, very happy that you just said that you uh, feel that you are a traditional journalist, traditional kind of journalist, because uh, uh, after these two days, I must say that I have been most of the time fascinated, but uh, on some occasion also disturbed by what I, I heard. You know, we had two groups, and we have two groups of people here, the dinosaurs, and I'm certainly one of those, uh, some people call the high priest. Uh, and one side, on the other side, you have the, the gurus of the uh, new cult, cult of uh, social and digital media, Uberales. Uh, but uh, still, the media are what they have been. And I think that if you uh, use these uh, new technologies, and I'm certainly using them as much as I can, and I'm very happy, fascinated by all these, and uh, I recognize even that there is a new human rights, not only to be uh, well informed, but to inform, and that's something new uh, created by these digital media. But still, there are very many problems, reliability, and uh, you know, the Reuters Institute at Oxford just uh, said that we should not uh, tweet first and verify later, and some organizations are doing that. L'Agence France Press just uh, put guidelines, in English as a matter of fact, online uh, telling their uh, journalists that they should not you know, publish something uh, that they got on Twitter without verifying it. And I share your view that uh, we have to be absolutely optimistic. And I hope that the next Schoenstein conference uh, will be uh, about uh, how the new media will actually force the traditional media to get better. I think what is endangered is uh, the, tra the, the tabloids, the bad media, the sensationalist media, because people now don't need news anymore. <laughs> uh, they have all the news they, they, they can uh, uh, dream of. They are inundated by news from the internet, TV, etc. But they are desperately looking for the meaning. Right. And for that, they still uh, need journalists. There is a great confusion between news, information on one side, and the media. The media are not the news. The media are the news interpreted, put, in, put into context by people who are journalists. So uh, agreeing with, with you that uh, we have a bright future, future uh, before us, uh, don't you think that you could all agree 
as Mr. Ito said, no matter what tools, tools we are using, that the mission of journalists has not changed. It is still what it used to be, it is today, and will be tomorrow, and that means to be a pillar of democracy on one side, and a, a tool to build a new covenant in the world, bringing people together. Right. And can we see that it's still the future of journalists, the future we are looking for, right. or is this no future? <laughs> Again, like, I'm a total optimist on this. I do think that the New York Times isn't going anywhere. The New York Times is actually in the middle of like a great experiment. If you think of the great upheaval, and I look at the great upheavals like really starting most powerfully in 2006, we're only kind of in the middle of it. We've basically, we've had the demolition or a lot of the demolition, the worst of the demolition, I think has taken place. And now you sift through it. How, and, and the big, we've already grappled with the technology. Most media companies are making that adaptation. Most media companies are right-sizing. And now it's how do you get people who have been trained, again, for some godforsaken reason by all of us to take our stuff for free, how do we train them to pay for it? People will pay for content. The New York Times is finding people will pay for content. Not all content, not commoditized content. They will pay for high quality content that they want. And so that's gonna take years. We're not gonna know that overnight. People are gonna look at what happens with the New York Times. Other people are experimenting with smaller versions, different versions, uh, and, and we're gonna figure out what works and it's going to be a combination of people paying for some content of advertising that's much more contextualized people are going to know a lot more about you as the consumer and so advertising one day is going to be worth more i think than it would have been uh, in the past and i think that's going to be able to fund news organizations it's just going to be different you might be getting your politics from politico instead of the washington post in the future you might be getting your financial news from something that doesn't even exist right now instead of the wall street journal I've been paying for content for years, and I, and I feel like I get robbed. I pay $50 a year for a premium service on, on uh, Wall Street, or in, on the journalsentinel.com, the Milwaukee Journal paper, to get extra coverage of the Packers. And they only give me like an extra story a week, and I still pay the 50 bucks even when I didn't have money. So people will pay, people will pay for content. And the thing yeah, I, I would encourage people, like all generations, to embrace is, just let it all happen. If some people want to get their news through social media, well, let them. I, I, it's a myth. I think people feel like 20 years ago, our entire population was sitting around reading the newspaper from cover to cover, skipping through the salacious stuff just to get to the deep policy coverage so we could be a super well-educated electorate. I don't believe that happened. Uh, I really don't. I think that there people wanted news. There's a certain set of us that want news we can trust, and they got it. And I believe people still want it. They get it, and they will want it in the future, and somebody is going to provide it. And what's happening now is a bunch of companies are trying to be innovative to figure out how you do that. And I don't think the values are going to die. People want trusted journalism. There are some people who want stuff down the middle. Think about blogs. Think about a lot of places that have taken off that, uh, that did just pop off and we worry so much about commentary and about just people arguing. Well, they have to argue about something. They're parasites. What they do is they suck our information, good information, so they can have a debate. So they need it too. They need the host. Uh, and that's what, that's what journalism provides. So I, again, I, I, I refuse to join the ranks of the gloomy. I'm Richard Sobel, I was a fellow here. Um, I, I want to wear my um, political science hat uh, as much as journalism and talk about core values in relationship to journalism and issue advocacy. But let me just comment a little bit about a couple things you just said about paying for content. I think one of the great things about the internet is having newspapers, magazines, and that content available for free and that's exactly what advertisers should be paying for. And to the extent that issue advocacy is an appropriate way of sponsoring journalism, those big corporations like Coke or Mobile that used to do op-eds, still do op-ed advertisements on the New York Times. And remember when that was controversial, Bank of America. They're trying to shape uh, a business environment. Well, I think that kind of content should be available freely. You also just talked about skipping through newspapers. One of the great things about reading a newspaper is you get the opportunity, even you're sort of forced or encouraged, nudged, to read about things you're not interested in. You also just mentioned, you know, 
having to give up information. We need, we need a question. I'm sorry. Okay. We, do, we've got, we don't have a... a okay. we, you have to give up information, private information. The real question is, how can you maintain the core values of democracy when all of these incentives are really leading towards more of a business model and less of an information and informing the public beyond their narrow interests, both in terms of the organizations that are presenting the information and the tendency of people to focus on what they're interested in rather than the public interest. Again, I think that that information is provided, will be provided. You might want if I, an ideal world. So you're like, I want all of this information to be for free. Right. I want to be, I want to have a full head of hair until I'm 75. Like, it's <laughs> not going to happen. And those, to produce that journalism is extremely expensive. So unless you're going to set up a not-for-profit and you're going to fund it, somebody has to fund it. So it's going to probably be a combination of advertising and subscription. So you say, well, then it should be advertising. Well, I'm telling you that advertising is what, the way that current companies are attacking it is what's going to destroy them. Because if you're, let's use the Washington Post as an example. Right now, you can, they can do really well with retail advertising. If you want to sell a car in the Washington area, well, the Washington Post, what best way to reach a big bucket of those people. We're already there or soon going to be to the point where you can just identify on Google and Yahoo and Facebook not only a bunch of people in that area, you're going to be able to track through their cookies what they're interested in. So you might be able to find the demographic and the specific person who's looking to buy a Ford to be able to have your Ford ad against it. Where are you going to go? I think you're going to go there. And so you have to find a way to fund journalism. And I think it's going to be a combination of different business models. I, in the beginning, I said, well, then create a not-for-profit. I think they're going to be part of it. I think not-for-profits are definitely going to play a role. There is a certain type of public interest journalism that's extremely expensive to produce that does, can't really be affixed to a good business model. That's why ProPublica is doing a great service. You might not like their funding basis, but they're doing a lot of investigative work that other companies just couldn't afford to do. But what I think will happen, and again, maybe I'm naive, I think what will happen is as we get these business models right, and I look at us, the more that we get our business model right, the more then, once you get it right, doing your core things, the more you can then afford to do the public interest journalism that we all got in to the business to do in the first place. So, you know, we've been able to, in the last two months, now we have a team that's covering just the influence of money in politics, that's five people. Why? Because we've been able to sort of put together a business model that works, and you know, you'll say, well, then these corporate interests can influence content and stuff. It, it, to me, it, that's like the debate about, uh, about Jim Van Dyke, are you a liberal, are you a conservative, or I don't trust what you write. I mean, I've written 10,000 stories probably in my life. They're all available online. Go read them, and you can make your judgment about whether or not you trust me or not. And if you don't trust me, don't read me. If you don't trust Politico, don't read it. That's how people make decisions. And so it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. There's going to be some things that are lost. The upheaval is very destructive to some things. Foreign coverage was brought up earlier. That's a tough one. And I think well, people will figure it out, but it's an extremely expensive, tough one to finance. And that's why a lot of people have pulled back from it and investigative. I am just optimistic that the combination of all the things I just discussed will produce that. Marilee? Uh, I'm Marilee This is Jim's Schwartz. old boss. I'm yeah, Jim's old boss. Oh, you better be former, nice. <laughs> and a former Shorenstein fellow. And I wanted to go very back to the beginning of why Politico was able to establish itself so quickly, other than the fact that you and John and Mike were so well trained at the Washington Post uh, and left with such an excellent reputation. <laughs> Marilee has this amazing gift for taking credit for everything in life, and now she's the, f the, the mother of Politico, and rightly so. No, but this is actually, you're leading to my next thing. I, in your narrative, I think what was so um, distinguished Politico, and I haven't seen whether even though Bloomberg has gazillions of dollars and David Bradley has gazillions of dollars, what you all did at the beginning and what Robert Albritton was willing to do was spend a gazillion dollars to brand you. And it was, you're right, the timing was perfect. There was just this window when Politico was created. So you did have a debate in May that cost a lot of money. And Politico was advertised everywhere and you were immediately in the game for that reason and for the quality of the journalism. And you soon were making money. Um, uh, so my question is, now in this world where you talk about competitors, where, if they don't have that kind of financial willingness to put all that money up front, 
with the knowing the risk may not pay off the way it has for Politico, what's the answer? I mean, it's, here's the one model that has worked. Justice right. Department investigators. Right, and not that easy to, and not that easy to replicate because we have this, we have a, our base, our advertisers, they, you know, they come from Washington, and as we all know, like Washington is, just, is a market that hasn't been hit as hard uh, by the economy, so it's been easier, so it's not easy to replicate. Where will they get the money? People want to invest. I hear all the time from people who want, there's a lot of venture capital that wants to get behind new startups. People want to get into the content production business. I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's a hesitancy in, in the market to, to invest in, in new media, so that's where it'll come. Uh, the only thing I want to uh, correct on, on Mary Lee's thing is, because uh, uh, it's an interesting story, was about when we launched, about how we had paid for all this publicity. We never, uh, and this was, again, this goes back to pure luck, we never spent a penny on marketing. And, and this is why, because when we launched, uh, we did two things. One, we hired Kim Kingsley away from, uh, uh, from the Washington Post, who's just a genius, who's now our COO. But she would promote us super aggressively to get, get us on TV. So whether it was on CNN or MSNBC or Face the Nation or some obscure channel in Fargo, uh, we would do any TV we possibly could because we figured the value of having a smart person with Politico underneath it was worth more than in any ad that we could, we could buy. Uh, and so the combination of that and then media fascination with us taking off, we had, I think the New York Times had three or four stories on us in that first six or seven months. So we had tons of, of earned media. So we never actually had to put that money in into marketing so we could invest in people. And again, in journalism, to me, in content, that's what matters. The technology debate, and I, I, I agree that's important, and we need to find technologists who understand, uh, who understand newsrooms and can really work with us. Uh, I find uh, technologists really hard to understand, and, and I'm really trying to understand them, and I want to be able to communicate so we can work together to figure things out. But if, if, if that MIT lab can produce those, like, I'll, I'll take a bunch. Uh, you please send, send them our way, because uh, I think that would be, uh, that'd be real helpful. Okay, three more questions. Hi, I'm Bob Kahlo, I'm a recent fellow here. Um, I'm a big fan of Politico, and I share your enthusiasm. Uh, but I, and I say this lovingly, what you really are is a, how can I say this lovingly? Uh, <laughs> Come on, say it lovingly. Drug, you're a drug dealer to political junkies. And, and, the, and that conversation, that political conversation, and everyone here is that, I am right. too. Right. Um, and that, that kind of journalist politics, snake swallowing the egg, close to power thing, is very uh, characteristic of American political reporting. So, and I, I think as a right-sized business, it makes great sense, and I think that's part of your success, which I appreciate. But you also know that, what's the number? 84% of American people think Congress is wasting its time. Right. Journalists stand only a little bit above that. So there's a whole huge, the public forum and the public conversation around politics is really broken in this country, except in, in this circle and your circle. Right. So what is the, you know, and this is just a kind of a cry for ideas, because that's something right. I'm interested in. How do you get those other people? Every, there's such a lack of trust in politicians, in the press, such a feeling of, feeling of dissatisfaction and uh, uh, betrayal by institutions. So yes, there's a robust political conversation in New York and Washington and, and, and amongst elite media right. circles, but in America, that conversation is bankrupt. So right. is there an opportunity there? Is there something that you think about? I mean, obviously, you think about it all the time, both as a citizen, but also as, a, as trying to figure out how you navigate that uh, as, a, as a media company. There's no doubt that there's that level of cynicism. You know, the way you try to fight against that is to try to speak truth, try to write stories, try to explain, like, the influence of money, explain why Congress is so dysfunctional, try to throw out different ideas that people can sort of think about uh, and debate. Like, changing that level of cynicism, I don't know. I mean, something's happening out there that I think is extremely dangerous. I mean, I think, it, and I don't think people really appreciate how combustible things are. Because it's not just loathing of government. I mean, there's that poll, you, you cited one, but there's one uh, two weeks ago uh, that 6% of people think that a me the, a members of Congress should get reelected. Like, ah, that's pretty bad, right? You're in politics, but it doesn't sound 6% were good. family. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, so that was probably the margin of air, but it's also discussed with Wall Street, which we see with, with the protests there. It's distrust of, of big business. It's distrust of, of lawyers. It's distrust of us. And I don't know how, I mean, it probably always existed. I don't know how you change that. I think a lot of it does trickle down from the political system, which is as dysfunctional, I think, as people think it is. I don't, how do you fix that? I think there's a lot of smart ideas percolating out there. I think it's really hard to me to look at Congress, and I covered Congress uh, 
under Mary Lee and others for, for a long time, more than I've covered anything else. And unless you can somehow change the racket of redistricting, I don't really know how you change the nature of Congress. You essentially have most states, most states still, and some are changing, but most states who basically have a bipartisan conspiracy to draw the weirdest looking districts that are possible to create and generate the craziest possible members of Congress from both sides. You end up with liberals that are way more liberal than, than Democrats that I know, and you end up with conservatives that are way more conservative than most Republicans that I know. And that creates a ton of uh, dysfunctional activity in Congress. It's not manufactured, it's not just politics. They are the far extremes. They truly are the far extremes. And I don't think that that's reflective of the country. And one of the things that's made things worse is you have seen an increase now of the number of members of the House than going over to the Senate. There's a higher percentage of that happening than before. And they bring their tactics and they bring their work experience, which was living in the warfare of the House, which I think has made the Senate more toxic than it might have been a decade ago. And I can't just blame that. Certainly media distrust, as an industry, we've screwed up enough things and, and, and we give people reasons uh, to distrust us or dislike us. But I do think the frustration broadly is, is the economy's bad, so it makes all of us grumpy. And then the, 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 the political system is so dysfunctional that people have an authentic reason to be outraged. Mr. Shapiro. Ah, oh, Walter Shapiro, former Shorenstein fellow, now at the New Republic, and I am actually going to ask a question that Mark McKinnon sort of asked earlier and sort of got lost in the shuffle, okay. and that is... Are you saying I dodged it? No, but <laughs> well, you sort of. It was a multi-part right, question, <laughs> and you only picked the parts that... Are, yes. All right, I'll try to... Uh, to uh, it's a Mitt Romney technique, <laughs> right. uh, but seriously. Um, I'm really curious. Um, and I understand that Politico is a niche publication as you define it. What are the things that you really seriously got through lots of meetings discussing that we should do at Politico and then decided, no, that isn't in our bailiwick? Or, and plus, what are things that you actually launched and said, no, actually, let's scale this back. This isn't who we are. Foreign coverage would be one obvious right. example, but I think there's a lot more. I mean, a lot of them, some of them just didn't work. There's a ton of things that we've tried. We did one thing institutions, because I think it's, it's true of all big institutions. Once they make a decision, they just stick with it. And it's really hard to undo it. And for us, like, we have no problem. Like, nope, we're just going to scrap that and go try something else. And you have to, you, I just think you have to keep trying that, because you never know what's going, uh, what's going to uh, what's gonna stick and what's not uh, going to stick. Does that answer, answer Walter? Yeah, good. good. And, and thank you for the follow-up, Walter. Uh, last question. I'll be brief. It's been great. Um, my name's Chris. Uh, two questions that are kind of overarching themes of the previous discussion and I missed yesterday's uh, dialogue as well, unfortunately. Um, I guess we can all agree that this is the information age, but is our information sufficiently secure from theft and illicit use? And the second question would be, how has technology changed politics? Um, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so they're both uh, big questions. Um, I'll start with how has technology changed politics? And I would actually be curious for, for Mark's take on this. Uh, I mean, it feels like it's rad. I went back and checked this the other day. Uh, four years ago, I think to almost the date, uh, Facebook had, I want to get this right, 35 million users. There's now 800 million. Twitter had 500,000 users. There's now 100 million. So like that fact alone has radically changed how this campaign is going to be covered. And we don't even really fully understand the ramifications of that. Way more people are getting their information that way than they're going to get it through any other way. And so you have campaigns, like I know the Obama administration has invested, uh, not the Obama administration, the Obama campaign has invested pretty heavily in hiring people who worked at Google or Facebook and other places to figure out how do we take this whole universe and all of the information, which goes to your first question, that is available about people either through following their cookies or figuring out what's on Twitter or figuring what's on Facebook and matching up ads with the aim of let's try to contact every single person who we think voted for us last time or could conceivably vote for us this time. And ideally, let's find out what issue they care most about and give them an ad uh, that speaks directly to it. And it kind of builds on something Carl Rove did and, and other folks did uh, in, on, in the Bush years where you would do this micro-targeting through magazine lists. So let's find out in upper Wisconsin where, where I'm from Wisconsin, the upper Wisconsin, let's get these magazines of, 
of a, a snowmobile magazine or a hunting magazine, and you could kind of guess if someone has a hunting magazine that there might be an issue that they care about, uh, and send them a direct mail. And so it was a very efficient way to sort of motivate people in a, with, with precision. And so I think that is, that is obviously uh, changed politics. As far as privacy, like whatever, there's significantly less of it today, uh, partly because technology has, has opened that up and it's so much easier to snoop into the things that are happening, partly because of, uh, I think a lot of us, not me, because I'm not on Twitter and Facebook, are putting a lot more out there. I mean, the amount of pe stuff that I see people posting about themselves to me is cringeworthy, but uh, certainly to a, to a possible, someone who cares about you can certainly give you a pretty good composite about what you're about. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how you fix that, how you change that. Certainly there's, there's, there's government has a, has a big role in that, but I think technology, the genie's out of the bottle, and there's only so much you're gonna be able to do to control that gene. Well, yeah, and uh, you, you discussed about people sharing information, but what about the information that they don't share that gets exposed or stolen? Right. I mean, that's what I'm saying. With tech, there's, there's only so much that you can do. I mean, I think that the criminals who know technology are often faster and savvier than any government entity that, or corporate entity that's going to try to limit access to that information. So I don't, it's not my area of expertise, but just looking at it from afar, I don't know that you can ever change that. I think it's the new reality. I just sort of, it's scary. I mean, I think about like my emails and everything else. Like, I just assume uh, and thankfully, I don't really have any big ghosts to hide. So if everyone wants to read my emails, I guess they're, they're going to eventually read them. Or if they're going to tap into your phone, they're going to tap into your phone. So I it personally don't get so worked up about it. But obviously, in democracy, you care a hell of a lot about it. And I don't know that there's that much that government can do or that even us as individuals can do to, to totally change that. Does that make sense? Mark, do you want to take a crack at yeah, that? Yeah, I do, uh, just quickly. Uh, on the first, on, on this last point about security, uh, I, I mean, there's the issue of, of literally identity theft. But, but other than that, I think that, and I, I don't have the research on it, but, but I know it intuitively, and I have read that just increasingly people just don't care that much about. It. They, they're, they're giving up information, and, and increasingly they just they care less about it now than they used to. On the technology side, I'll just say, it, it, we could spend an, uh, easily an hour with a vigorous conversation about all the ways in which technology has transformed politics in the last decade. And you know you could point to Nick O'Malley over here and what he did with Howard Dean, uh, or or look at the memo he wrote in 2007 and talk about the things that haven't happened, that even relate more to today about how so many it's changed so many things in our culture and yet really hasn't changed that much in our politics. But just one little heads up on what will happen next year that's going to be a transformative thing with technology. There is going to be an online alternative nominating convention next June by an organization called Americans Elect. And they are already have half the signatures they need to be on, on all the ballot in 50 states. And they're going to be on the ballot in all 50 states. And it's all going to be done online. So that'll be very interesting to watch. I have one final, final question for Jim. Why are 90% of your readers BlackBerry users and not smartphone users? I meant to follow up with that. <laughs> well, I would say of our DC-based uh, readers. Because okay. DC is just a very... I think there's a because they all have this too, right? Government, government uh, they have contract. Well, I think government you have to have a blackberry. Is it, is but I'm we're also all we do so much. More, I think so much of our work day in and day out is is just typing on that thing, and I could bang out an 1,800 word story as quick on that now as I could on my computer, which is sad. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, for some reason th that hasn't changed, and I, I think this recent disruption might actually change it. For the first time, I actually went to our tech department and said I want to try an Android based operating system that has a keyboard that's similar uh, to the BlackBerry, so I don't have to deal with that disruption. But I, it's just something very unique to the DC uh, market, which, d again, like helps in the short term. But OK, so what happens? That's going to change quickly to the Android operating system. Luckily, we build all of our stuff internally, so we can adapt to that uh, pretty quickly. But we're, that's what our life is now. We have to keep adapting. Here you go. Thanks. Um, well, th okay. thank you both. Thank you both. That was a terrific uh, concluding. We have, uh, we have come to the end of this 25th anniversary celebration. We have lunch for you in the, uh, the room over here. But uh, before we part, I want to say an enormous word of thanks to the staff of the Shorenstein Center that worked so very hard on this. Uh, if you would, Edie, Heather, Christina, and Martha Stewart, who has been constantly here taking photographs. Uh, this has been 
This has been an enormous amount of work, and I'm glad to say that it was worth every bit of the work we put into it, I believe. I feel like um, for the Shorenstein Center, this is the beginning of something, not a discrete event. At least that's what I intend, and that's what I believe we will uh, we'll be, we will we will do. Uh, we have a a responsibility on the one hand, Janelle. I see you over there, so I want to include you too. And John, you guys, thank you so much. Really, um, we feel like we are in a critical time. We feel like we're in a terrific place. We feel like we've got the resources and the vision and the opportunity, and indeed the responsibility to keep this kind of a conversation going. This was an important conversation to have. There are many more subjects and there are many more conversations to come. We want to be at the center of that conversational process. Harvard is unique in that it can, it can genuinely bring people like these two and the ones you've also heard today and yesterday together and using technology can make that a conversation that can be shared with a great number of people and through the generosity of people like Tuan and others uh, can be even in you know languages other than English and so forth. That's what I believe the Shorenstein Center's job is significantly as we go forward because these issues are ones that are evolving. These themes are vitally important and the values that have been mentioned again and again are ones that we believe, certainly at the Shorenstein Center, we believe need to be embedded in these kinds of conversations. The question that Nick O'Malley asked, I think, is, is a critical one because I think it'll be a disaster if these issues are discussed without the context of values that they represent embedded in them. That's something that we feel like that's part of our, our mission and our job.